Hello everyone. It's uh, pretty early here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I thought I'd take advantage of the quiet to answer some of your questions. And I did this last year. I'll probably end up doing it every year now. I get a lot of email questions and even some uh, in the comments section. And I'll either print out the emails or just write them out. I get a lot of the same type of ones, and so I prioritize those. So that's what we'll do today. Uh, so I'll just go through these one by one, try not to ramble, and get through as many as I can. So the most common one was, how do I practice? I got a lot of that. So um, I practice every day. I have since I was probably 10 years old, uh, willingly. I think. <laughs> My mom always used to tell me I, she used to have to chase me around the house and I'd hide under the bed so I wouldn't practice. I can't remember that, but I don't doubt it. So right now I love to practice. And when I turned a certain age, uh, maybe junior high school, I kind of got addicted to practicing. And I started practicing lots and lots and more and more. And by the time I was in college, I was probably practicing anywhere from eight to 16 hours a day in between classes and then over the summers I'd practice all day every day because I had access to the building and I live right down the street from Manhattan School of Music. I'd just go there early in the morning and I'd stay till really late at night if I didn't have a gig. Uh, now that's a lot of hours and I did not do that on one instrument. I was doing you know timpani, marimba, orchestral audition stuff that I was always getting ready for. Obviously drum set, hand percussion, vibraphone. So I was practicing a lot of things. And if you add all those up and you do an hour or two on each, that's what happens. I still practice a lot. During this pandemic, I've been playing a lot more than I have been in many, many years, which is great for me. Uh, obviously all the gigs have been canceled, but I've had stuff that I've wanted to work on for a while, so I'm doing that. But as you get older, it becomes harder to practice so much because your body has worn down a bit and it's just not possible, you know, to do that many hours. So some days I'm doing, you know, maybe six or seven or even eight hours. Other days I'll do four. Some days I'll make these videos. Uh, some days I'll hang out with my wife. Some days I'll make sticks, so I try to vary it during this thing so I don't go too crazy. And the way I always practice is I divide my practicing up into sections. I'll warm up always for like an hour before I start getting into anything really technical. Uh, the older you get, the more you want to warm up. In the winter, I run my hands over warm water. Taking a warm shower helps get my body I warmed up. I have a little bit of arthritis, so that really helps with that. Uh, when I was younger, I probably didn't warm up as much as I should have, maybe 20 minutes or maybe sometimes not at all. That was a mistake. Shouldn't do that. Should always warm up. And I warm up with, you know, real slow stuff, stuff from my Three Camps book, stuff from Morello's Master Studies, but nothing really fast. And I use a heavier stick. I know I've told you guys that a bunch to warm up with. That gets me nice and loose, and I practice any kind of technical exercise with a heavier stick. That doesn't mean the diameter is thicker. It's the same as my regular stick. It's just a heavier wood. Uh, those are the sticks that I make. So that's how I'm practicing now, and I'm always working on reading, sight reading to keep my older brain functioning, and some sort of technical coordination exercise these days to keep my body fresh and my mind fresh. So I'll never run out of stuff to practice. I'm sure I'll be gone way before I finish working on what I want to work on. So I hope that answers that. And then the next question I got was, how much should I practice? Well, that's up to you how much time you have if you're driving your family crazy, if you have somewhere to practice that's quiet. I just put up a video on building a practice booth. Maybe you can take advantage of that. That'll give you more time to practice. I know it helped me when I lived in New York. Uh, you can practice as much as you want. If you're, if you're young and healthy and have a good space to practice, I would do no less than four hours a day if you want to be a professional musician. Uh, there's a lot to work on. 
especially uh, drum set and marimba. Those are the hardest instruments to work on. Not that you're going to make a, a superb living playing marimba, but it's important if you're going to teach, if you're trying to get a college gig, if you're going to play in an orchestra, you need to have that skill to work on that. And of course, reading on every instrument is going to be really important. So practice as much as you can, uh, especially over the summer, and especially when you're young. The prime time to practice is when you're from 15 all the way through your 20s. That's your developmental time. By the time you hit 30, physically you're probably as good as you're ever going to be. It's all downhill from there. Mentally, you still got a long way to go, usually. But physically, that's when you need to do your most uh, positive development on the instrument. I also got uh, a lot of questions on my rivet cymbal video. Uh, the most common was, how many rivets should I put in a cymbal? It doesn't really matter. I mean, I put eight in 20-inch ride cymbals. Sometimes I put three in. Sometimes if I'm fixing a crack, I'll put rivets in around the crack. I'm getting ready to do a ride cymbal video really shortly. That's the next one on the list. So that should be going up within a week. Uh, or maybe a few days, depending on how soon I get it done. And I'll be demonstrating lots of sizzle cymbals. I love sizzle cymbals. I put rivets in everything. So I'll probably have maybe six or seven that I'll show you guys. And they'll have different rivets in them, so you'll see that. Different spots on the cymbal, different patterns. But eight is what I do for standard ride cymbals, and that's what I did on that video because it's the simplest thing for people to learn how to do, and it's pretty standard. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, how do I tune my drums to sound good? Yesterday I did a drum tuning video. That should be up by now. So just watch that. Excuse me, I just need to take a sip of this. <clears throat> Excuse me. Why do you need so many drum sets? <laughs> that was a good one. Uh, I guess they saw this from my jazz drum video. Well, uh, uh, sorry to tell you, but I have even more drum sets than that. I probably have 13 or 14 of them at this point. I have so many drum sets because I like the drums and I like different drum sets and it's fun to play on different sets. And they all sound different and I play a lot of types of music and a lot of kinds of recording sessions. And I use different sets for different things. Some of the sets I use a lot, some not so much. Uh, it just depends on how I feel. I'll switch them up. And I really don't have a good answer. I just really love the drums. And I love beautiful drum sets that sound good. So that's why. <laughs> all right. Uh, should I learn how to play all that other stuff? I guess other stuff means all the stuff that I've been putting up on YouTube, all the different things, different percussion instruments and hand drums and you know, this and that. Uh, yeah, if you're going to be a professional musician, you better. Uh, especially if you're going to be a drummer or a percussionist. There's lots of us out there. Besides guitar players, drum, drummers are the most popular instrument. I read that somewhere. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they're really good drum players. They might be drum owners. To play professionally, uh, any kind of percussion or drum set, you need to be really good to compete with other people who are really good. Obviously, there's never been this many great drummers on the planet. And again, we're living in the age of the drum set. So when they look back 100 years from now, this will be like, you know, Beethoven, Beethoven's time where he was living in the world of the pianoforte, when the piano had just been kind of finalized or it was invented, created, the final version of it was happening. And this is the way it is for the drum set now. So Probably the greatest drum set players have already lived. There's always room for improvement, but there's been so many great innovators over the last hundred years on that instrument, and it's still going. So, you know, that's, um, I guess I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but, oh yeah, the other stuff, you know, like marimba, timpani, hand drums, uh, any kind of orchestral percussion instrument, those are things that are going to help you make your living if you're a professional. If you just play drum set, you're probably going to be in trouble, especially these days. Uh, you know, the music industry has really changed. 
It used to be that you could make a lot of money recording. I know I did. Now the money is made by playing live. And we're doing a pandemic right now, so I'm sure live playing is going to come back. I'm not worried about that at all. It may be a little while, but it will. And that's where we make our money. So you need to play as much as you can, as many gigs as you can, to make a living. And therefore, if you know more instruments and do that well, then you could do better. And you don't have to get another job. I've never had another job besides playing or teaching music. So that's why you need to learn that other stuff. Okay. Um, should I try to go to school for music? That's a very common question. And the answer is uh, complicated. It's very expensive to go to a music school like a conservatory. I believe it's extremely overpriced. It's almost funny how expensive it is. I went to a great music school almost for free because I got a big scholarship. But now they're so expensive. You're talking sixty or 70000 a year. That's just crazy to do that. On the other hand, you get a great education. I know I did. I got to play with great musicians, great teachers, um, great ensembles. But just getting into that kind of debt is, and especially if you're going to be a professional musician, if you don't come from a wealthy family and you're going to have to pay that debt yourself, to me that makes no sense. The better option would be to go to a public uh, state university in your state or one that's cheaper somewhere else that has a good music program, and there's plenty of them, and try to get an education that way, and then maybe do your master's or doctorate at a conservatory and get some sort of teaching fellowship or uh, scholarship where you're not going to go into debt. The worst thing to have as a musician, a professional musician, is debt. You want to avoid that because it pins you down. You can't go do auditions. It's hard to move around. Uh, it's hard to have a family, so it's a, it's a scary thing. So try to stay out of debt the best you can if you're going to be a professional musician. And there's plenty of, if you're a really good player, there's plenty of universities that will give you a scholarship to go there. Depends how good you are. There's a lot of competition. but So yeah, the answer to that, I would definitely do some higher education. There's nothing that can replace that. But I would not go into life-crushing debt to do it. Uh, you don't have to go to college to be a professional musician. No one's ever asked me when I play a gig, where's your degree? Of course, I'd, I've needed that degree to get my college gig, of course, but not for playing a gig. So there's plenty of musicians out there who never went to college or finished college, and they play their butts off. So that's not a precursor to being a great musician or having a great career. Uh, there's other things that are, but that's not one of them. But if you have the opportunity to do it, I definitely would do it. And you don't have to go into, you know, crushing debt. Then, yes, that's the answer to that. Okay. Should I use heavy sticks when I practice? I think I just answered that. But I do. Uh, now, again, the diameter shouldn't be larger. I like the diameter to stay the same so my grip, my fulcrum there, doesn't, you know, open up too much. Like, I don't practice with marching band sticks. There's nothing wrong with those. They're just big. And I have small hands, so I like to practice with about a 5 eighths stick that's heavy. Uh, keeps my hands relaxed, builds or strengthens or maintains uh, any muscles. I play very relaxed. I know you guys know that because I've done tons of videos on it. So that's important to let the stick do the work. And a heavier stick will do most of the work. That doesn't affect when I play with my drumstick that Vic Firth makes me, which is about 50 grams. I practice with a stick that's anywhere from 60 to 75 grams. So it's a pretty good range. I have a lot of sticks that I've made that are within that range. So I do that. Um, oh yeah, and the next one that goes in with that, should I play on a pillow or blanket? Uh, I don't. I don't do gigs on pillows or blankets. I don't see the benefit for that. Some people think it builds their wrists. Uh, I think playing with a little heavier stick on a real drum or drum pad with a real head is all you need to do. If you want to play on a pillow or a blanket or something soft, that's fine. You can do that, I guess. But again, I've never been one to do that. Uh, I'm not a real heavy wrist player. I don't play like that. I play I more let the stick bounce, like I just said, and follow that stick. Use a lot of fingers. So 
Uh, I don't want to get anybody upset who teaches that or, or does that, but I don't do that. So I can't really answer that question, but all I can tell you is I don't do it and I don't teach it. So uh, I got a good one here. Why do you play everything so fast? <laughs> well, my, my YouTube channel is kind of an advanced channel, so it's not really for beginners. So most of the stuff I cover has some speed to it. You know, when I do those etudes, those studies, those Wilcox and Souls, Pratt, all that stuff is meant to be played at a certain tempo, and I don't want to make the videos too long in that case, so I'll play them, you know, the tempo that they're written, and then I might do a close-up. On my three camps videos, I play them half-time first, and then I do them double-time, so you might want to look at some of that. You can also on YouTube slow down the videos, so you can do that. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but there's a place, I think, if you click to your right somewhere, I remember, that you can slow it down to almost half speed. So you might want to try that. But my channel being what it is with the material being kind of advanced, a lot of that stuff is up-tempo. And there's plenty of stuff that's great and slower, like the Vic Firth website is really good and you know, for, for beginners, but I don't really teach beginners and, anymore. And uh, my channel's not really geared towards beginners, it's geared towards intermediate to advanced players. So that's why I guess I'm playing stuff fast. Okay, um, oops, page two. Take a sip of this. Uh, why did you put ads on your channel? Yeah, I had to do that recently. Well, I didn't have to do it, but I just need a, a, some steady source of income now that I'm not playing any gigs. Most of all my gigs, were, everything was canceled from March. We were in the middle of the symphony season, and I had lots of sessions planned and lots of jazz gigs and some festivals and all that some clinics, and those were all canceled like in one day, pretty much. It's pretty crazy. I've never had that happen. It was nuts, really. And so I'm trying to make income as much as I can. I'm teaching a lot of Skype lessons. I'm selling a lot of drumsticks, making sticks, I'm selling books that I've written. Uh, and, you know, another way I can do it is just monetize my channel. I never wanted to do that, and it never was like that until, you know, March. But, you know, I kind of have to have, I got to make money. This is what I do for a living. I got a family. I got bills to pay. So that's why I did it. Hopefully you can hit skip after three or four seconds. I don't, you know, put ads in the middle of my videos. I could make more if I did that, but I don't. I don't do it so you can't skip them. I try to keep it, you know, in moderation. It annoys the hell out of me, especially when I see political ads. I just want to strangle someone. But again, those ads are geared towards who's ever watching them in our world. And, you know, it's, that's the way it's going to be. I apologize, but that's just uh, going to have to be that way for now. Okay, uh, can you talk about injuries and drumming? Well, I can. I've never had any injuries from drumming. I have had injuries from doing construction, which I've done a lot of construction. I've built couple houses, I built my studio, and I've gotten tendonitis in my elbow and my wrists and my, I've torn my rotator cuffs, both of them, several times. I've fallen off of ladders. I once pretty much almost fell off a roof, but a rope <laughs> saved me. So I'm pretty clumsy. Uh, I don't recommend doing it. It's just I like doing it. I like to build stuff, and that's kind of my hobby. I'm going to stop getting on roofs, and I'm probably going to stop heavy construction because um, my body can't really do it anymore. But I still do a lot of woodworking. Those have were, uh, been where my injuries have occurred. Still got all my fingers. Uh, I'm really careful when I use table saws. I do. I'm very careful. Always wear glasses and, you know, eye protection, lung protection. Those are important things if you do any of that. But things happen. You know, uh, for drumming, I've been really blessed where I've never had any drumming-related issues. Even now, I'm in my mid-50s, not any problems, but those other injuries have affected my drumming where I can't play for a couple weeks, especially the tennis elbow, tendonitis, which is common if you do construction with the nail guns or any kind of hammering or screw guns or, you know, lifting heavy lumber, anything like that's going to affect this, so be careful of that. So I can't really answer to the physical drumming injuries. If you're having drumming injuries, it's probably because you're overdoing it uh, maybe your sticks are too wide or more too heavy, uh, you're practicing too much, or you're definitely maybe playing too tight and using, you know, banging or leaving the stick or your foot on the head with the beater. That could be why it, you're having it. 
there's plenty of books out there, and there's doctors who spe specialize in sports medicine, and they might be able to help you. And even musical injuries, there are few and far between those kinds of doctors. But in big cities like New York, uh, there's doctors who do that. So if you're having really bad trouble, you want to maybe do that. Uh, be wary of any kind of heavy-duty physical therapy. I've been through that. Sometimes those folks, uh, they have the same regimen for everybody. And if you tell them you're a musician and you do this or that, they don't care. They're going to do the same thing they do for an athlete. And that's not always the best way of recovery. I've never had surgery for any of my injuries from construction. I believe in letting my body heal. Now, if it got bad enough, obviously, I would explore that. But, you know, my rotator cuff stuff has actually healed up. I've not had them go in there and, you know, do that. I'm, a, I'm afraid of that, actually. Uh, I'm afraid something will happen and someone will screw up and that'll be it. So I let things heal. And over time, it might take six or seven months sometimes. I can still play. It just hurts when I do it. The worst thing is playing uh, piati cymbals in an orchestra because that really kills your shoulders. Uh, but, you know, I, I play through it and it heals eventually. And I, right now I'm pretty good. So uh, I can't really talk about, you know, how you get injuries from drumming because I don't know. But that's the way I would think you'd get it from the same way I get them from construction is, you know, heavy things maybe using muscles the way they're not supposed to be used. So uh, the last one is one I, <laughs> I addressed on my last video as well. I always get this. Why do you say some words so much? Uh, I just do that. I do uh a lot. I do so. Uh, somebody said I sound like somebody on The Simpsons. I love The Simpsons, so that was funny. That's just the way I talk. I can't change it. And I don't do any editing on my videos. Very rarely do I do that. It takes too much time and then I can't do more videos. So I'm just going to keep talking like I talk. And that's just going to be the way it's going to be. Sometimes I'll pause and say, uh, or whatever, because I'm thinking of the next thing I'm going to say. I don't use a teleprompter. Prompter. I don't have a script. I just basically just talk to you like I'd be talking to anyone. So if you came for a lesson for me, that's exactly what I'd sound like and what I'd look like. So I'm not really going to change the way I am or talk because I'm doing a video. I don't care really about that. So that's not going to change. But I enjoy the comments. They're very funny. Uh, they don't bother me. And go ahead and keep them going. So uh, that answers. <laughs> I just did two in one, in one breath. That answers those questions. I have a few more, but we'll get to those next time. Keep them coming. I love your questions. I love your comments. And stay safe and keep practicing. Thanks.